How are you today? Hello, everyone. Hello, yours. As always, feeling pretty good. How are you? I'm good. Today, we're going to be talking about a disappearance of Kristen Modafferi, who was an 18-year-old girl who vanished under mysterious circumstances on June 23rd, back in 1997. She vanished after she had left her work at a local mall in San Francisco, California. She was working at a coffee shop. She had recently relocated at that point from North Carolina to San Francisco Bay Area. And actually, the day after she disappeared, she was expected to start her photography classes at UC Berkeley which is a fairly well-known university. Oh, definitely. You heard about this mm -hmm. one, right? Yeah, and since you already know a lot about this case, would you say she's the type of person who would um, skip her class, her photography class, or did she seem like more of this responsible kind of student? Well, from all of the information I was able to find online, she was definitely the responsible person. She had even skipped a class back in middle school because she was a very good student oh she never did so it's clearly not her intention yeah definitely i got the not. information that I, I got the sorry not the information but i got the notion that this is definitely not something that kristen planned and uh, her disappearance is very how should i put it very strange it's almost like almost like brian schaefer type of a case here that we're dealing with because it seems like she just vanished into thin air and it's, there's really not a lot of like concrete clues but there's a lot of small weird things happening in her story and i guess talking about this case makes sense to me right now because it's not that well i would say publicized case Obviously, more than some other ones, for sure. It has a Wikipedia page and some articles online, but I wanted to kind of bring this up today because I had this case on my mind actually for quite a while. I wanted to take a deeper look into it and see what's happening here. So, we have an 18 year old girl, well, a young woman basically, Kristen, and she was. Uh, studying already in North Carolina and she finished her first year in North Carolina and summer came up and some um, for her summer vacation she went to San Francisco because she had spent some time with her family several years prior and the city of San Francisco left a great impression on her so she wanted to come back makes sense right uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense. A uh, typical teenagers, like for example, you went somewhere and it inspired you to do better or like yeah. to live there. But at the same time, it's probably a very, I wouldn't want to say risky, but I would say very uh, courageous thing to do. Oh yeah, as, for... in, as an 18 year old girl. Mm -hmm. So definitely. I read somewhere that within the first day, she already had a job. She got a job on day one. I think she was just hustling and applying everywhere. So she went there. I don't know when exactly she found um, uh, uh, a place to stay, but uh, it was mentioned that she went on Craigslist to find a place to stay. So she actually rented a room inside of a house and there were i believe four other male roommates living with her in that house now it's kind of i don't know maybe i'm just weird like that but mm -hmm. to me it immediately kind of is a, a weird thing yeah. one girl four male roommates i don't know maybe i'm just a weird person what do you think about that oh no it's a definitely it's definitely an odd situation to be in strange as an 18 year old girl mm -hmm. coming from across the united states or you immediately move in with some four random dudes i mean maybe they're all great but you know there are all types of people there yeah but at the same time maybe she kind of strikes me from the pictures like the type of a person who's very responsible definitely she looks really smart 
but she's also she also maybe maybe she had that kind of uh, young people naive she's still innocent innocent the world seems very um, safe and yeah, trusting and you exactly. haven't really seen anything really to, uh, maybe maybe she already had we're just assuming assuming yeah definitely. yeah but I, i get the same vibe so Kristen, what she did next right so she gets a job and and somehow one of the employments and i don't remember which it was because she was working at uh, two coffee shops one coffee shop at a local mall Um, that is the basically place where she was last seen and then she had another job at a another coffee shop at a modern art museum also kind of in close proximity because I don't think neither of those jobs were uh, full-time as I understand or at least one of them was part-time so she had to juggle two jobs to kind of stay afloat um, for the summer so Kristen had been in San Francisco for three weeks prior to her disappearance. So it's safe to say that she was already got her feet wet and she already kind of got a sense of what she was doing. We even have information that uh, Kristen, I think uh, within the first few days was already like hanging out with people and went to a party. She was also taking up photography classes. So one of her favorite activities to do after her shift ended in the coffee shop. The coffee shop was called Spinelli's, I believe, something like that. It's a San Francisco based coffee shop brand that was purchased by another company. So you can't find any Spinelli's anymore. They merged into some different store at this point. But after she would, you know, clock out, she would go and take pictures all over San Francisco from the information that they have, which just seems like pretty regular uh, 18-year-old inspired activities. What do you think so far? Oh yeah, definitely. She definitely sounded like a very inspired teenager. Right. So now we have we have a house and we're looking at the house where she stayed. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the street right now, but it's uh, this house with uh, the number 274 in the San Francisco area. Okay. What, do you, what do you think about the house? What, this is the house. For our listeners, I would describe the house as a perfectly normal American house. Perfectly normal house, right? Nothing yeah. strange so far. Uh, the front lawn is probably not properly cared for, but that's pretty much it. But this is the regular l- late, uh, you know, the Kristen disappeared back in 1997. And this is probably from a couple of years ago. So oh. we, we don't really know how the house looked, but yeah. the, the general, you know, the general structure was the same. I don't sense any bad vibes around this area. It really just looks like a typical neighborhood. But that's interesting, though, because look at this. You see, this is where she stayed. She stayed at house 274. And I found some sources online that house 278 was a halfway house for criminals on parole. Wait, what? Yeah, I think I've seen some some information. And I could be wrong here, but I was able to like find something mentioned online that house 278 was potentially a half a halfway house, or at least had maybe people renting. The place who were on parole. Do you think they this could be in connection with her disappearance? No, I'm just saying that's something maybe worth talking about. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. This reminds me of the case we did earlier, Jalen, Jalen Griffin. Yes. Uh, same thing. Like same it thing. Looks like a typical house, but there were horrors hidden inside oh yeah i do think that the uh, that case uh jalen's um disappearance there we had the more uh, depressed uh neighborhood this is still you know san francisco oh yeah True. it's a little bit more let's say looks looks to be kind of fancy a little uh, bit more high-end more high-end stuff uh, here so i have some information about her three weeks that she spent in San Francisco before she disappeared. So she moved 
uh, to the location actually on June 1st. 1997 it was actually her 18th birthday so get this on the first day that Kristen became an adult she moved to San Francisco for the summer that's a big adult move right there oh definitely right mm -hmm. within a few days she had lined up summer jobs at Spinelli's which is a coffee shop inside the Crocker Galleria which is a name of a pretty fancy mall that nowadays is actually quite abandoned According to TripAdvisor, there are barely any retail shops left in that mall. Um, apparently, retail stores are not doing that well anymore in that part of um, San Francisco. But back in the day, it had shops. It was basically packed. So one of the you know one of the places there was the Spinelli's Coffee Shop, where she found employment. She also found employment at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art which had a cafe inside of that museum. So she was doing two jobs at the same time. So each morning, she would catch this kind of weird thing called the Bay Area Rapid Transit or BART. It's like this sky train. You know what the sky train is. Mm -hmm. So she would catch the sky train at 7 a.m. That's when her... Um, you know, job would start in the morning and then she would clock out at 3 p.m. And every day, according to this uh, source that they have, Kristen would explore um, the city after work with her camera. One night, shortly after arriving to San Francisco, Kristen went to a concert at Shoreline which was a live 105 music festival featuring Blur and Fiona Apple. Once the show was over, she realized that she had missed the last train home. So she was a very trusting person and she decided to split a cab bill with a young man that she had just met and stayed overnight at his apartment. Now, in the morning, she went straight to her job at Spinelli's. This man was later tracked down and cleared by police as a suspect in her disappearance. And I haven't seen anything else mentioned about this man that Kristen spent a night over at his place. Um, so I would presume that this guy is not involved. But kind of gives gives you uh, a sense of Kristen's very trusting nature at yeah. this point, right? What do you think about this whole situation? Nothing actually. She's just very trusting, and I. It's kind of understandable being that young. Once again, it seems like she's a little bit naive in a sense, not not in the bad way, just in a young way, like very trusting always expects the good things in people you know what i mean has oh, yeah. a lot of dreams uh, hustles she's very responsible and she seemed like she just wants to achieve a lot of things in life and thinks experience world, a lot of things and, yeah. and basically make some connections mm -hmm. thinks the world is so nice and there are no bad people yeah, I, I, I agree. Now let's jump to the day when she disappeared. There's some strange things that happen. Pretty strange things. I want your take on some of them. So let's move to June 23rd, three weeks after her 18th birthday and three weeks as she was already living in San Francisco. She went to work and work seemed pretty normal. Um, she went to Spinelli's in the mall. And she finished her work around 3 p.m. By the way, this is the mall. What do you think about the mall? The mall looks kind of nice. Looks fancy. Looks kind, yeah, kind of fancy. Looks fancy, right? Looks like a looks like a. This was way end, back then. Yeah, Impressive. high 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 end mall, right? She indicated at one point to her co-workers that she considered visiting Baker Beach that afternoon to potentially attend the party. So now I have a map here. Um, this is the map of San Francisco, as you can see. So this is the Crooker Galleria or Galeria. This is the mall, right? And now Baker Beach is on the west side of San Francisco. It's this really nice looking beach. Um, so she could have either went to Baker Beach, people believe, uh, this location right here where I have the, you know, like a 
red arrow pointing towards it or there's this other beach called the ocean beach and apparently this is where she suggested to her colleagues at work that she's gonna go to one of these malls so she was actually most likely taking a bus from the east side of San, downtown San Francisco to the west side of that San Francisco island to go to the ocean beach does this make sense so far uh, yeah, but it seems like there's quite a distance. In it's not. It's, it's not only really. It's like um, it's like maybe half an hour on a bus. Oh, okay, so it, not that it, bad then. Yeah, it doesn't. It may might look like it's a big trip. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that big. So at Spinelli's, coworkers recall that Kristen had asked them for directions to lands and beach. Now this is where things get kind of confusing because we're not locals to San Francisco, so I don't really know what exactly lands and beach is. But I believe land and beach is somewhere here. It's either this ocean beach, like generally like the beach area. We presume that she was heading to the beach area. Now this was strange because I found a source where detectives claim that. Kristen had been there just a day or two prior for a summer solstice party. And why would she ask for directions to a location that she had visited a couple of days ago? I don't know, maybe I'm looking too much into it. Yeah, I, I feel like she, I'm looking too much into it. Yeah, maybe she was with her friends. Maybe there was someone driving or maybe they took the public transportation altogether. Was she completely alone by then? You're asking me? I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, you're you're thinking that maybe I'm looking too much into it. This is not this is not anything here. Yeah. We don't have anything here, right? I don't think so because I could see I could see I could picture myself doing the same thing. Might have gone there once, and I'm like, how do I go there again? Maybe what's the best way to get? There? Ah, yeah was the fastest way to get to the beach, right? Mm -hmm. So many news stories at the time reported that Kristen almost certainly headed to the beach that day after work on the day of her disappearance. An amateur investigator named Dennis Mahone, who has a podcast, and I've listened to a few of his podcasts, he has some a lot of insider information on this case. He later interviewed Kristen's co-workers at Spinelli and he told the newspaper San Francisco Gate that while Kristen had floated the idea of heading to the beach after her shift, uh, the co-workers said that she was non-committal. Which is, uh, maybe that means that she was like, kind of going there. But but we don't know for, like, like maybe this guy, uh, Dennis Mahon, introduces some... Uh, some some something like some some questions that maybe she didn't actually go there does that make any sense yeah i think it was just an idea like she could go there she could have not gone yeah you know what i mean like uh sure i'll go by the park later on but plans could change yeah exactly and typical 18 year old fashion mm -hmm. you are just gonna go with the flow yeah exactly at around 45 minutes after her shift ended at Spinelli's on the day when she disappeared, co-workers from Spinelli's saw Kristen with an unidentified blonde woman on the second floor of that same mall. Now, the woman has never been identified and she has yet to step forward. A blonde woman. They think it could be just a stranger asking for directions or maybe like a customer. Yeah. So the only things that I found another source like about the sighting. So apparently the person who saw they're not uh, who saw Kristen, they're not really sure if that was actually Kristen. It just looked like it was Kristen. Uh. And uh, that person I remember thinking that that sighting was quite unusual. Well, there's a lot of what ifs here. Like, what if it wasn't her? What if it was her, but what if it's just a random stranger asking for directions? What if they actually know each other? What if, what if, what if? There's a lot of possibilities in this, like, small information given. Yeah, but this blonde woman never stepped forward. 
maybe it was just a very small maybe, interaction in the maybe day. small interaction maybe this the if it was Kristen maybe the blonde woman didn't even know who she was talking to yeah maybe she didn't even know it was Kristen mm -hmm. never even heard about Kristen's disappearance case yeah maybe it's just a very small part of the day of her day she was yeah. just a red hearing I agree yeah. I definitely think that this blonde woman doesn't play any role mm -hmm. in my opinion same Okay, video so surveillance last caught Kristen withdrawing cash from a Wells Fargo ATM. I don't know exactly when and where, but we know that she was last caught on a security camera. Once again, seems like there's nothing out of the ordinary so far. So far, everything seems good, right? Mm -hmm. Kristen failed to attend the first day of her photography class at UC Berkeley the following day. And there we go something weird yeah so it's generally assumed that she didn't return home on the 23rd after she left home her roommates they didn't find her coming back home and this was strange because she had already paid 925 dollars in tuition for the course and additionally she had left a 400 dollar paycheck at spinelli's unclaimed so she definitely, she, something's bad at this yeah, point. Yeah, definitely. Her, her roommates noted that she did not return home on the night on the 23rd, but they did not report her as a missing person, which is kind of strange, because the only... When, when did Kristen got reported missing was several days after her disappearance, where when her father left a voicemail to the house landline and one of her roommates returned his call and informed him nobody at the house had seen her for three days. So no one really paid, no one really, I guess, found it that suspicious that Kristen had not returned home for three days. I mean... I I mean when 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 would you raise a flag red flag? Three days. Um, this eighteen year old girl didn't return back. I'm thinking more like maybe they didn't have that kind of friendship connection, like that strong friendship. It's more of like strangers or acquaintances living in the same place. So yeah, yeah if I do have like an acquaintance who hasn't, who I haven't seen for days, I would just assume that maybe that's that acquaintance is just somewhere else left for North Carolina, who knows? Yeah. So I think it's still normal, at least the roommates behave normal in a way that if they all had a closer relationship, they would have known it's not normal. normal for her. So you don't think it's that suspicious? No, I think it's just a typical uh, young acquaintances type of situation okay what I, do you think i actually think the same okay i actually think the same i don't find anything suspicious right now so several days later i'm um, sorry i'm gonna i was about to tell you the same information sorry uh another thing i want to say that like right after you know the parents realized that her their daughter is missing basically they flew to san francisco uh almost like on the same day it was june 27th and uh, they reported her missing. Uh, a $50,000 reward was set for any information leading to her return, but nothing came about. And this is where we are gonna jump to the clues. Because there are some clues that I want you to kind of tell me what you think about these clues right now. So the first clue that we have in Kristen's disappearance case was that police bloodhounds traced her scent to the Muni 38 Geary bus from a bus stop outside of the mall where she worked. Her trail was also noted by the bloodhounds that near the end of the bus route at Suturo Heights Park but her scent was lost near that location so basically what I'm trying to tell you right now that bloodhounds indicated that she was at the bus stop close to the mall where she worked and they also indicated that she was at the last stop at the beach where she would kind of go to the beach you know what i mean so it's almost like we have a, we have a pretty strong suspicion that she did end up at the beach because bloodhounds 
indicated that she was at one bus stop and the other bus stop. Mm -hmm. So I think it's credible. Yeah, it seems so. In my opinion, yep. right? So this is the clue number one. So it looks like she did actually go to the beach. Now, clue number two was that her family members found a Bay Guardian newspaper stuffed in a trash can in her room with a personal ad circled which read friends female seeking friends to share activities who enjoy music photography working out walks coffee or simple or simply the beach exploring the bay area interested call me and law enforcement was unable to locate the individual who had placed this ad as the newspaper had purged their backlog for the week. And there is no indication that Kristen responded to that ad. I think so. Why would you circle an ad in a newspaper? And throw it out. And throw... Yeah. You know what's even weirder for me is this ad. Like, what kind of person posts an ad like seeking friends like i could just imagine how many creepers that ad would attract you know this is the time before we had smartphones yeah but still I 97 find it so weird. this is probably normal in 97 you think so i think so i think mm -hmm. this is probably a normal thing to do back then um now the father uh bob he said that he thinks there was a chance that maybe Kristen wrote that ad because when you think about it it literally lists everything photography. about Kristen beach. who enjoy music photography beach it's like literally the things walks coffee simply the beach exploring the bay area oh yeah it, it almost seems like it was Kristen who plays this ad because it seems like all of these details are a perfect description of Kristen. It so it's so. so strange. And it maybe makes sense why she circled that ad because even if it wasn't Kristen who made that ad, it's kind of crazy because what it's a like coincidence. A, what a coincidence. Like the it's like a, a a copy of Kristen, essentially. And do you think she wrote this ad and attracted creepers. I mean, that's one line of thinking. Now, there is a phone number attached to this ad. You know how there's like the text and there's the phone number. So I don't really know if they were able to kind of pinpoint who exactly wrote this ad because he had the phone number of that person. But apparently they were never, never able to figure out who exactly placed this ad. So that's all the information I have. But this is a, it's a strange clue, right? It's yeah. It's it makes you think. It makes you think about this case a bit. Mm -hmm. it makes you think like maybe she did meet someone. Yeah, I'm leaning more into that line of thinking actually. That she met someone? Because I mean, why would you circle and not call that person? You mm -hmm. would definitely call. So I think Kristen maybe called this person, but then maybe it was just a, a new friend. So. Another clue came uh, by July 10th. So this is like, I believe, a couple of weeks into her disappearance. When a man phoned a local TV station claiming that Kristen was murdered by two jealous lesbians. Wait, what? Yeah. So a man calls um, the local TV station and he says that Kristen was murdered by two jealous lesbians after some sort of a love affair gone wrong. So eventually law enforcement were able to identify the caller, which was John Anuma. So basically in the phone call to the news uh, station, this man, John Anuma, he actually told who these two lesbians were. There were two employees at the San Francisco YCMA. And uh, when law enforcement spoke to these two women, they immediately cleared them of any involvement because it seemed like someone is just, you know, trying to tarnish their reputation. 
And now they ask those two ladies at the YCMA, like, who could, who could do this to you? Like, do you have any enemies? And they were like, John Anuma. So there was this guy, John Anuma, and then they found him and then he confessed to making that phone call. And he confessed to making that phone call because basically he had falsely implicated the two women as he felt that the two women were conspiring to get his girlfriend Jim, Jill Lampo fired from her job at that same YMCA. So, so to kind of protect his girlfriend, John and Onuma calls uh, a news station and says that these two lesbians from YMCA actually murdered, uh, murdered Chris. I don't know. This one's just, I feel like it's not really connected to the case but this one's just crazy i mean but the, but listen here so john anuma he actually lived close to the mall he lived close to the mall and when they looked at his apartment they found a sizable amount of blood in his apartment uh, it was later described uh, figured out that that blood actually belonged to a cat but it's still strange why is there so much cat blood in the house doesn't make any sense to me. It also was discovered that John Anuma had previously placed personal advertisements for women in the Bay Area and coerced them into some relationships, bad potential relationships. Uh, John Anuma re relocated to his native Hawaii a couple of years later. I think John is the creeper that I was talking about. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. So we even have uh, some other people who came out later and they said that John Anuma was actually very physically abusive to women Three other women came forward and claimed that John Anuma had abused and tortured them. He also reportedly used other women to lure women to him. They suspected that that blonde woman may have been an associate of his that lured Kristen to him. And... Uh, when the victims were questioned, one of the female victims of John Anuma's assault, she said that John mentioned Kristen in a threat to her, stating that the same thing that happened to her could happen to you. That's how he threatened one of his female victims. Allegedly, because I don't know if this is like real information, mm -hmm. but so far John Anuma looks like uh, like he he's the one who did it no no he looks interesting like he no. looks like an interesting person he looks definitely terrifying and he seems like it he could have done it like he could be responsible for uh Kristen's vanishing yeah right or at least he knew something he knew something about mm -hmm. it right all right, well, that's where uh, we have to put a dot on John Anuma, at least for now, because uh, that's all the information I have. But now there are kind of very weird new clues that came out, like, in 2015. So almost 20 years after um, Kristen vanished, some really strange stuff started happening. So there's this guy called, um, I'm trying to find his name, Dr. Arpad Wass, right? He's a for forensic uh, anthropologist from the University of Tennessee with a very questionable reputation. He's uh, basically claiming that he can find your missing loved one by just getting that person's mother's DNA sample and then he uses some sort of a metal rod to like kind of pinpoint the direction where that person's remains are it's kind of strange 
but he does have some sort of credibility because he works in a university in Tennessee. So seems like a very strange individual. Anyways, he apparently developed some sort of a weird contraption where he can identify a chemical signature and uh, basically he and another man named Paul Dosti, who was, I believe, a, a former uh, Mammoth Lakes police sergeant who actually owned a very highly capable cadaver dog, they both investigated the house, the house where Kristen lived. So both of them started looking into the house. So Paul brought out his world-class reputation dog, who is a very good like sniffer dog. And then Dr. Arpad Vas came out with his kind of crazy, weird chemical technology, right? So basically what they got is that they indicated that there's presence of the human blood discovered near a concrete slab at the base of the porch steps at the 278 Jane Avenue residence. So 278 is that halfway house potentially. So now they found some weird stuff. And I believe even um, Dr. Arpard Vass made some sort of a DNA connection between the DNA that was found in the location and the DNA of Kristen's parents. So obviously makes a match that maybe Kristen's blood is actually there. And they tried to get law enforcement to start digging into that concrete slab. But law enforcement stated that they, that neither of these two men provided them enough information so that they could begin the search. Anyways, what do you make of this situation? I mean, I believe them. If, so, if it's like a halfway house who, that we're housing, as you mentioned before, like... Uh, people on parole, right? People on parole. Anything could happen. And it makes sense because... But... Really quickly, yeah. I just want to say that um, I believe uh, I, I, I wasn't able to find anything incriminating about the four male roommates. Because obviously we would probably think that maybe the four male roommates were in on it and they maybe committed like foul play. But I didn't find anything about them, anything strange about them. At least there's nothing like online that I could find. So, mm -hmm. So once again... I still think that Kristen did not arrive back home. Yeah. But would it be possible that she was arriving back home? She got then, intercepted by someone yeah. from 278. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. That's another That's another question. But then again, what about the scent? Scent? From bus stop close to the mall to the beach. Yeah, maybe she went back also. Maybe it was a normal beach day and she went back home. Mm -hmm. And maybe someone from 278 intercepted Kristen. I mean, this is really wild speculation, but... But it makes sense. I don't know. For me, it makes sense. Right. So, this is basically all the information that we have so far on uh, Kristen's disappearance case. And this kind of jumps us to the potential outcomes, in my opinion, the theories. So the first theory is that uh, there was an accident at the beach. Um, and actually, that beach, the Lands End Beach, is actually super dangerous. There's plenty of articles of people by accident slipping off of big um, cliffs. Mm -hmm. Boulders and all? Yeah, and drowning. That's a dangerous beach. It has a strong current, apparently, and it's really cold. I don't know, maybe in, Ju in, in June, July, it's maybe not that cold, but still, it's a very dangerous beach. And even if you Google randomly, like, um, you know, people drowning in uh, San Francisco beach area, there's plenty of articles. I found like three articles, recent articles of people passing away in the beach. What do you, so, so I'm actually even thinking that this is, in my opinion, this is the most, I mean, somehow, I don't know, I just personally didn't find more information. I believe that um, 
that's where I'm going with. I think yeah. that maybe there was an accident. I think that she maybe did go to the beach mm -hmm. and then she had an accident. Yeah, actually thinking about it more, I kind of am siding with you in this case because if she managed to get out, wouldn't there be more scent or more clues? Exactly. But why did the scent and why did everything just end it there at the bus stop and then nothing? I have no idea. That's a very good question. And I have no idea, honestly. So, um, John and Uma, do you think that there's a chance? He already lied about it. He called the radio station. Yeah. Incriminating those two ladies. Yeah. And it was a one big lie because of hatred. I do think he might have been a liar, but I don't know. He's definitely a creep, but I don't think he did it. So Jill, his uh, girlfriend at that time, they had split up a long time ago, did a recent interview and she threw some suspicion towards him because the re news reporter asked Jill, why would John do it? And then Jill said, well, I think he wanted to bring attention to himself. And why would he do that? That kind of shows guilt to me. That's something that she said. Mm -hmm. So she sort of incriminated John in a recent interview. Do you think John could have potentially written something or maybe written that ad or responded to that ad? They met at the beach and then the crime happened there. I think that could be the case. I think that I don't see why that could not be the case. I don't see why that could not be the case. That could be the case. That's true. Could be a possibility. It could be a possibility in my opinion. Why not, right? We don't know what John Anuma was doing on the day when Kirsten disappeared. I don't have this information. It does seem very sleazy. Like, very sketchy and violent. And apparently he also told other women that um, I'm gonna have to kill you now, like I killed Kristen. What kind of normal person does that? No, no normal person does that. So other other um, uh, theories would be that maybe there was some sort of a foul play uh, happening uh, in regards to the roommates. But the roommates uh, seem pretty straight straightforward. The only thing is that they never really reported her missing. But once again, I believe you when you say that maybe it's actually just them being like not that close with uh, Kristen. Mm -hmm. They don't know who Kristen is. They maybe knew her for like three weeks. So they yeah. were thinking just, just a random girl. She didn't show up back home. Maybe just she's, a roommate. Yeah, just a roommate. Maybe she's spending a night over at someone else's place. Who knows? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I don't I don't find them suspicious. So for me, it really is between John and Uma, the really strange creep, allegedly who did some weird stuff like like weirdly implicated himself and then also was apparently living close to the to the uh mall which also kind of is just weird just really suspicious john and numa behavior or an accident that took place at the beach so i'm actually torn between these two theories i mean I it could know. be both what do you think though what do you think it could be both. It could be both, yeah. But yeah. What, what, what do you think? John Anuma claimed that he has never met this woman. Can we believe John Anuma? No. Definitely not. I don't think so. So at this point, I would like to say, let's leave it to the audience members who listen to this uh, case. And what do you guys think? Do you think it's an accident or do you think it was foul play? Yeah, what do you guys think? Thank you for listening and we will catch you on the next episode. Thank you. See you. Bye.